Well, um, welcome everyone. Um, so I'm Kara, and I just wanted to say thank you so much for having me. It's been a real pleasure to um, be a juror for this exhibit. Um, to introduce myself a little bit, I know Hilly kind of introduced me earlier, but um, I'm a visual artist from Vancouver. Um, I did my BFA at Emily Carr and then followed by residency at Columbia. Um, and the medium that I tend to gravitate towards is obviously painting. Um, and over the years, it's kind of evolved thematically in terms of what I'm interested in. But um, really, the topic of portraiture has been something that's fascinated me for a long time because of its connection to identity or perceived identity uh, construction. So I kind of keep returning to that subject and kind of the ways in which I can unpack it a little further. In terms of my current practice, my work really explores um, the transactional nature of portraiture and image. So I'm really interested in, I guess, the balance between consumption and denial in painting. So the information that the viewer is given and the information that's kind of withheld from the viewer and then the, the sort of uh, dynamic of that and how that sort of comes together. Um, so I often use my own body as a reference and that's really because I feel the most free with my own body um, because I, I feel like if I paint somebody other than me, then I have to kind of consider, you know, how they want to be represented. Whereas with my own body, I'm very free to do whatever I want with it, to treat it as a prop, to represent and explore my identity. There's a certain kind of liberty in that, which is very interesting. And also because I'm so interested in exploring the connection of like identity with, with self-image, um, self-portraiture has kind of been something that I keep coming back to as well as a matter of convenience because you are always there for yourself and because I like to work from life it's um, I am probably the only person I know who's willing to sit for myself as long as it takes to create all of these works um, and as well I'm kind of interested in this idea of self-image as, as kind of an extended object and how the tropes of historical portraiture come to define and negate our perception of identity so a lot of my works really navigate the slippery boundary between the seen and the unseen, the known and the unknown, and the line between literal space and psychological space. Um, and each painting really contemplates the dynamics of viewership and what it means to look and to see. So the depicted subjects in my paintings are often partially concealed from the viewer in some way, to greater or lesser degrees, it really depends. Um, but I often foreground figures, objects, parts of the body, in this case, the one that's on the screen here, um, even the space sometimes over top of parts of the what we might expect from a conventional portrait. And in doing this, I'm really interested in questioning that sort of conventional expectation about what a portrait is, um, allowing the subject to kind of retain a piece of their experience or their identity for themselves that the viewer can't fully access. And really in doing that, calling attention or questioning, challenging, just exploring, what or who a portrait is for and what the role of portraiture is. Um, so yeah, some of these paintings are really, really about that. I can kind of talk through as, I, as I'm working through this, um, but just to kind of talk a little bit before I get going through some slides, um, a lot of my paintings, as well as being deeply personal and about psychological space and all that, are also about kind of re-examining and responding to conventions that are found in, in Western figure painting in a way that also disrupts their original meaning and intent. So I've been, um, you know, kind of alienated, I guess, by the, the idealized representations of women within historical art. Um, and, and a lot of my work really responds to that kind of idealized, perfected body, the um, staging, the ornamentation, the posing of historical portraiture to kind of unpick it, to create an alternate narrative, to, to I guess, yeah, just kind of almost take back that language of historical painting and make it seem more um, relevant um, or more real or more tangible. So kind of take that language that was used to idealize and perfect and to paint things from my environment that are kind of um, refuting or changing that, that narrative. So this painting is called Headpiece and this is a self-portrait. Um, obviously, I kind of am just playing with that idea of the convention of, of you know, the hair and the styling and kind of twisting it. There's often a little bit of a humorous component to my work. Sometimes it's about poking fun too. Um, and I like to kind of toy with, with just that idea of, of posing and staging. Um, this next piece is called Icon. And this one um, is, it's a self-portrait again. Um, 
to me, obviously, because some of these are like anonymous self portraits, it's not really important that it's known that it's a self portrait, other than to say that I tend to use things also from my immediate environment. So I often have post it notes floating around. Um, I tend to like incorporate those elements into the paintings. Uh, I like to take mundane things and then make them part of the subject matter. Um, again, just thinking about, you know, in, in historical Western portraits, they tended to be about like showcasing wealth and glory and opulence. And so I kind of like the idea of textures um, and things that catch the light the way that like an opulent fabric might, but that's like very mundane and very pared down and just kind of like disposable. Um, and again, it's a way it's like partly humorous. It's also partly not humorous. <laughs> it's a little bit of all of that at the same time, um, but just kind of exploring, I guess, what other objects can like, how can I twist that meaning um, and how can I do something fresh with it? This piece is called Wallflower. And again, just really thinking about the gesture as forcing the viewer kind of out of the picture, but also inviting them to connect with the figure in a different way. So those ones are kind of generally playing with posing and just kind of exploring, I guess, ways that I can make a portrait that is um, inviting the viewer to connect with the figure in a different way from usual. Sometimes I will take a very specific painting and then I create like a translation of it, but like a distorted translation so that um, the, the finished piece has nothing to do really with the original, but it kind of derives its meaning. So this next one is kind of that, um, this is actually painting my mom um, and it's called Looking Glass. And this one takes um, glasses from my childhood and, and I put them in front of her and kind of created this construction. And this painting actually began as a, um, response to or distorted translation of a Velasquez painting called the Rock of Be Venus. And you'd probably never realize that by looking at it, but I was really interested in this painting because this is kind of this, you know, classic perfected female nude that we see so much of in Western art history, um, where the female body is actually like contorted and kind of, you know, it's not like a real like the, the the twisting of the waist the way the shoulder's been represented it's not like real proportions it's been like quite distorted and the other thing that really interested me about this painting was the reflection in the mirror is also not like the angle of it is not accurate it's kind of all done again to reveal more of the body for the the viewer's um pleasure and so i kind of became like again interested in that idea like how can i like make this painting but like completely differently in a way that feels like actually like respond to this but like kind of correct all the <laughs> things i guess that i'm reacting to um and so again I, I kind of just flipped i reversed everything so instead of a younger woman i have an older woman instead of the allegorical perfected venus i have my mother who for me is my origin story is very dear to me somebody that's that's very special but also very close and not abstract um someone who is clothed rather than nude and then for the reflections I just became really interested in that idea of like distorted reflection but also reflection that's kind of like you're looking through it rather than just at it um, and so if you kind of look at the glass there's all these little flipped and distorted reflections of how her face kind of got turned into that and so I liked that way of kind of connecting with somebody that has been so close to me in this way and and really um I paint my mom a lot. Um, I think because, you know, it's always fascinating to me how I can have spent so much time around someone and, and I can always find these new ways to almost to learn her through painting and, you know, through painting her hand, through painting the way her, the light catches her hair. I learn about all of these kind of interesting things that I've never really taken the time to appreciate. And there's a really beautiful thing about the connecting with someone in that way through the act of painting that's so different from photographing. Um, because I don't have that deep connection if I, if I just snap a photograph. I don't take the time to kind of slowly observe and unpack all of those moments. So this painting really was um, quite a journey in that regard of like learning all of these different aspects, both of the, the glasses that I'd spent so much time around in my life, but again, never really seen them, as well as just the sweater as being something that, that you know, has been worn so many times and again, just connecting with it in that way. And then obviously my mom too, just kind of getting that chance to connect with her over such a sustained period of time in this way. 
Um, and this next painting is called Halo. And again, it's kind of like a little bit of a tongue in cheek twisting of kind of the traditional halos. I'll bring them up here that we see so much in like a Renaissance and medieval art. Um, again, this is sort of a subject that, you know, we see so much of and I experienced a bit of a disconnect from, but I was sort of fascinated by this, like the way that these these halos and the symbol of the halo is this beam of light that kind of surrounds the figure. And so I, I started to think about like, how could I make like a very literal halo that does the opposite and like what in my environment relates to that kind of sense. And, and the obvious choice for me was the lamp that I actually light my subjects with, which is the photo lamp. Oops. Um, and this lamp actually has traveled with me a fair bit. So it came with me to New York and it got it got mailed and it actually got beat up and kind of battered a little bit. It's a little bit broken. I can't kind of connect it. So it's sort of the opposite of this idea of the perfect beam of light. Um, and I was really interested again in taking something that is so often, you know, not something that's painted with the picture. We use we use the lamp to light something, but we never actually see the lamp. And so actually making that the dominant subject of the painting and then having the viewer cut off from the very thing that it's lighting sort of fascinated me, as well as a sense of like a subject that's almost lighting themselves for themselves. So again, the viewer is kind of witnessing this figure having a moment on their own that you can't fully access, but you can access part of it. And there's sort of this, um, disconnect and also connection in, in through that. Um, so in addition to kind of portraits and flipping that kind of sense, I'm also interested in like features that tend to get foregrounded a little bit less. So hands and feet as, as ways of knowing a person are really interesting to me. Um, this painting is called Peeled Banner, and this is actually my mother's feet, and um, it's on the floor of my childhood home. So it's interesting to me because, again, this floor is something, you know, it's like a laminate wood floor. I've probably walked on it, I don't know how many times, but I never really, like, studied it until I painted it, which is sort of fascinating, just how much time you can spend around things that you don't really internalize. But I now know this little patch of it. <laughs> I don't know the whole floor, but I know this little patch of it very, very well. And um, this painting was, uh, again, I just really interested in this idea of like feet as being very specific to a person and yet also kind of anonymous. So this idea of kind of creating a portrait of someone that you know, but also like in a way that, you know, it's, it's specific to a person in, in all of the nuance, but it's also anonymous. Um, and this form of the peeled apple actually came from those little banners that you see in, in like Renaissance paintings quite often with little texts that are just floating in the air. Um, and I, I sort of thought that form was really intriguing to me, that idea of the curling and the spiral. And again, I'm trying to think of something like a way of like distorting that, but in a very literal way. And, and the apple peel was something that kind of correlated to that, but in this very tangible, very relatable way that um, felt, you know, a lot less sublime, but also still really beautiful. And so this was kind of a way to connect with it and, and to think about that form um, in a way that felt much more real. Um, and this is actually a painting of my hands and it, this was kind of um, inspired by a Hans Holbein painting of, of an dressed up aristocratic lady holding her white evening gloves. Um, and so I kind of took that into like a glove from my studio, uh, which is actually what I wear when I paint. So these blue sort of natural gloves, it was just a very literal way of kind of thinking about um, those forms, but still getting to access that way the light is hitting it and and also just, you know, again, grounding it, bringing it back to reality in a way that feels a lot less um, elitist, I suppose, in a way that feels a lot more tangible and, and relatable to me. Oops, I'm going to focus on this one. Um, and this is another self-portrait. I'm very, very interested in hands because um, to me, just the lines that get etched in them over time based on our activities or age, the way that you can sort of see through the skin, the way that um, you get the sense of like the veins, the coloring, 
um, I find them very, very interesting because they're so specific and they really do kind of tell the history of a person. And yet again, that they're, they're kind of anonymous. So I, I really do find I, I keep coming back to hands as a subject because they're very, very intriguing to me. And I like this idea of a portrait that sort of uses that as a way of kind of blocking out the typical portrait, but is also like, I guess my question is like, is that any less specific in a way to the person? Is that any less knowable in a way? And yet we kind of have this hierarchy of the features in the way that we rank them. One thing that, that happens to me often when I paint myself is I have um, a split sense of identity, I suppose, um, in that, I guess like in the act of painting, you're looking at yourself like objectively. So there's a sort of a weird self objectification that happens, but at the same time, you're learning yourself, you're becoming closer to yourself at the same time. So there's this weird twisting, I suppose, of like getting closer to yourself and also further away from yourself at the same time. Um, as well as I just find it fascinating, like we can never really encounter our own faces directly. You know, there's always through a photo or through a mirror and there's always a disconnect from like our own image and so it's hard not to like have that come in when you're painting to really think about that strange sense of like what is your sense of self and how do you relate to yourself um so this is actually a, a split cell portrait the hands in the foreground are are done in reference to my own hands as well as the figure in the background and it really kind of mimics that sense of i guess what it feels like to paint myself it's just like being split off from myself but also sort of like all entrenched in the same space and time and just kind of yeah that's splitting off um i think time for me is is something that's become a really big subject in my work too um merging together different temporal moments so in this case two versions of myself um as well as obviously through the slow and kind of layered approach in which the paintings are made so I, I always um, paint in part from life. I will always kind of reference um, if it's myself, I'm, I'm looking a lot in mirrors. If, if um, it's a model, I'll always have them sit for me for at least part of the process because I'm really interested in the way like um, time comes to manifest itself through light and shadow and the paintings really become this sort of fusion of those different temporal moments. So that kind of comes in, even if it's not really evident, I really think about that in a very conscious way in, in what I'm painting that each of these things is not a snapshot. It's very much a subject happening across time. Like the hair wisps are going to be different every time I'm looking at myself. Um, the way the light the warmth of the light because I'm often painting from a window natural light is going to be different sometimes it's warmer cooler and I kind of have that sense of like having to navigate that as time passes and it sort of creates an interesting um, relationship to the subject and really each layer of paint comes to symbolize a different moment in time um, this is again kind of a painting of my mother and and my own hand is in the foreground um, though I, to me it's not really that important who the subjects are in this particular case i i started to become a little bit more interested in in the correlation between actual spatial environments as and with psychological space and the way like spaces can come to represent people and like the spaces that we inhabit begin to like embody mind space and so um, in this particular piece, I really thought about like representing that through a relationship between the wall color and the sleeve in the foreground of like thinking of the body as the space almost. Um, as well as just thinking again about that sense of the mirror as being something that usually reveals more is like how can I have a mirror that both reveals but also conceals. And this is actually a, a double sided mirror that um, was my mother's kind of growing up. And so again, it's just objects that have very sort of memory or nostalgia significance in, in my personal history that I tend to want to come back to and paint as a way of kind of internalizing them, committing them to memory. Um, and, and I very much thought in this case too about like the hand that's kind of projecting out into the viewer's space as a way of like almost pulling you into the painting or, or a way of relating to that body in some capacity. Um, this piece is called Burge. Um, and it's really, this piece for me was really about an interest, again, in, in space as kind of a psychological thing connected to the bodies, um, but also really an exercise in like perspective and experience. 
So for me, in some cases, this painting is actually about three bodies rather than two. Um, it's the two figures in the painting, but also the viewer's body kind of looking into the space. And the fact that all three figures, the viewer and these two figures, are experiencing the same space from completely different perspectives. And none of them are kind of seeing the same thing or encountering the same thing. And yet they're all kind of sharing the experience of being in this space in some way together. Um, and in some ways, like life feels like that to me <laughs> a little bit that everyone has kind of their own perspectives and their own experiences. And we're all sort of united in the, in the fact that we have that subjectivity. Um, I'm also really interested in this sense of like, I guess the space, the walls becoming something like the center of the painting, almost foregrounded in front of the figures, cutting off the figures. Walls, we think of walls as backgrounds, you know, they're unimportant. But again, the walls, um, you know, these walls are kind of, we build our lives within them and, they, and a lot is contained within them. So I was really kind of interested in playing with that in the sense of like, you know, walls as both a barrier, but also as a safe haven and as, as a, can be a, a place of, of refuge as well. So thinking about just kind of like the spaces we create and, and the, the role of walls in them and how we relate to them. Um, this is kind of another self-portrait where I've just kind of flipped and a little bit like that other one where I'm kind of exploring myself from two different temporal, temporal moments merged together from two different perspectives at the same time. So I really like that idea of just like seeing but also not seeing two sides of something. Um, and how something can kind of be both, again, like access and denial at the same time. Um, this next piece is called Waiting Game. And this is a, an example of kind of how I'm interested in merging time or painting across time a little bit. Because what I did for this piece was to actually, again, I'm coming back to the subject of post-it notes, but um, I hung them on the wall and then I kind of painted them as they fell across time. So it, it ended up being like the, the finished painting is kind of chronicling the way that they sort of fell um, over a period of time, over several months, um, so that you end up with something that's sort of merging the beginning and the end together. Um, and again, just really interested in, in flipping expectations within portraiture. So taking a chair that's usually a support for the body and flipping it so that it's foregrounded in front of the body as well as becoming a way of like inviting the viewer almost to think about themselves walking into the space and to sit in that chair and perhaps be looking back at themselves. So that sensibility of like, again, just making the viewer conscious of the fact that they are viewing and, and their relationship to this, the painterly space, I suppose. This next piece is also kind of merging different temporal moments. So this is called flip side and it is um, a double self-portrait kind of of both sides of the wall merged together as one. Um, there are a few little subtle differences that um, kind of allude to the passage of time in a way that um, you kind of have to look for them. But one is that the sleeve on this side of the painting is peeking out from the wall whereas it is not on this side. So it's sort of like, oh, you think you're seeing the flip side of the same body, but there's just this little twist of like something else happened there. It's not quite the same. Um, as well as the shadows are kind of painted across the day. So like this shadow is kind of going upwards, whereas this shadow is going downwards. And there's a sense of like the drifting of light being connected. And it's very subtle. It's things that you don't really notice, but I like to play those little subtle twists in the painting where you might notice something is slightly odd um, or a little uncanny, and it kind of creates um, a slightly surrealist sensibility, I suppose. Um, and this next painting is called Growth Spurt, and again, it's a self-portrait. And this one was actually done um, painting a pot of daisies across its natural life cycle. So it was inspired by an old shirt that I had that had this sort of perfected daisy print all over it. Um, and I became really interested in this idea of the symbol of the daisy, the perfect sort of symbol of the daisy and how it contrasted with the messiness and beauty of the real daisy, which wasn't perfect, which might have sort of little bug bites out of the petals, which might be wilting, which might have brown spots, um, which doesn't stay fixed. And so what I did is I actually dug up um, some wild daisy just from a ditch 
and I planted them in a pot and it was over the course of a summer and I actually ended up I think with like three or four pots of these daisies because I wanted to have them all kind of at different spots in their life cycle and and I would just sort of paint them as they kind of bloomed and wilted and died and so the painting is like a fusion of all of those moments and this is kind of just a little process shot of like the daisies in my studio and I kind of have the pot there and just be studying it and going back and forth and here's just kind of a detailed view of that you can sort of see the little nuances um yeah so it was a kind of a fun piece to do it felt very deeply personal and really about just relating to nature and connecting to that as well as obviously the parallels just between like the life cycle of a plant and our own life cycle and how we're so interconnected with that and and just kind of finding that um just deep deep connection i guess to to the life in all things um, so that sort of is my concealed portrait series. I sort of have two separate series that I'm currently working on. They're very interrelated to me, but they are sort of separate bodies of work. Um, the other one is also a concealed portrait series, but it's done as a literal sort of working or playing with images from historical Western art that were very much part of my, I guess, initial art history education. And again, just reacting to that, responding to that, challenging it um, and changing it. Um, so this painting is called The Three Graces and just taking the painting of The Three Graces and actually cutting out the figures, creating a still life, and then creating a painting from that still life um, in a lighted context. And again, it's just really about talking about the way meaning changes across time, the way context changes meaning. Um, for me, you know, until quite recently, I hadn't seen a lot of these art historical paintings firsthand in real life. So the way that I kind of studied them and experienced them really was either through a computer screen or through an art book. And so there was this sort of sensibility of them being connected to that, I guess, objectification of an object. Um, and obviously, as I was talking about, again, just like these idealized forms as being something that I always sort of experienced a disconnect from. Um, and, and sort of wanting to, I guess, challenge that perspective to think about relating to these bodies differently. Um, this one is actually called The Birth of Venus, and this is done from Botticelli's very famous painting, The Birth of Venus, which I think I have an image of somewhere, well, this painting, basically. Um, so I feel like this painting gets used a lot even today, just in like, you know, fashion <laughs> model shoots and that kind of thing as inspiration of like idealized beauty. And again, you sort of have this very like distorted female form. Um, and I suppose you could say I distorted it further, but I feel like I'm responding to a distortion of a distortion. And it's interesting because for me, in the act of playing with this image as an object, which is like how I encounter it, I don't, I'm not really approaching it when I'm crumpling it with like a fully destructive energy. There's like a desire to connect to the subject differently. So I really think about it in a strange way, like doing this kind of humanizes the subjects to me because it makes them feel like they have a story. And it makes them feel like they're allowed to be imperfect um, and, and to kind of grow beyond their fixed form. So it's sort of a weird and interesting journey of like relating to the textural and the tactile components and then like seeing how that kind of changes how I relate to it and what what that painting connotes. Um, this piece is called Outside In and this was actually done as part of a residency that I completed this uh, past year at HCMA which is an architecture firm so it was kind of an interesting residency. Um, I was asked to create a piece on the theme of um, like basically city, city spaces. Um, an empty city was the theme, um, specifically I think inspired by the pandemic. And because it was very much related to exterior space, that's something that I'm quite, you know, not familiar with as much, but I was interested in like the ways that I could make that into an interior space. So I started looking at like images of, of paintings from the canon of Western art that reference people in the city and then kind of creating this mashup and I settled on um, this painting by James Tissot which is the London Visitors and and this uh, Renaissance fresco by Ghirland Dio which um, and I kind of was interested in the form of the stairs and basically I just started by cutting the figures out and I sort of created this mishmash to life in my window that kind of continued to evolve and then I ended up painting in the openings of the cutouts that I made 
sort of the trees from my backyard filtering through and that kind of uh, conglomerated together to create this image, which to me really talks about um, introspection and rebuilding and, and really reevaluating monuments and thing and kind of deconstructing and reconstructing as well as just thinking about like um, the relationship to nature and, and space um, and how like I guess in creating openings or, or in removing certain parts you create space for other things to happen. Um, so I was kind of interested in that specifically obviously this was partly inspired by pandemic times and that feeling of like, I guess, change that that came about as a result of that. Um, connecting with space differently, thinking about windows and doorways and the potential of cross connectivity in that way. And, and also thinking about the potential for nature reclaiming um, spaces and industrialized spaces and that type of thing. These are just kind of some close up details of the paintings, you can sort of see some of the details. There's a picture of me working on it as well, so you can sort of see the scale. <laughs> um, and th this is actually a painting I'm kind of working on now. This is called Muse. So again, just kind of a, a still life compilation of, it's a Botticelli painting in the background and some Venus figures. Again, just sort of really thinking about um, the tactility of the paper as being a disrupting force in the perfection of the bodies and also coming to mimic like inevitably sort of wrinkles um, in the sense of aging um, but just a disruption of the materiality of the paper and the flipping and, and kind of playing with that idea and trust me I also included the cutting mats that I'm actually kind of doing the cutting on as as a a backdrop and then I have an in-process painting that definitely has less layers on it so you'll be able to see but this is actually a an Ingres painting so that's um this painting here with the the figure kind of crumpled up and then painted and again really interested in like to me as much as I'm crumpling this figure also like how it kind of humanizes this body to me in a different way like really thinking still about this as being like a person but a person with like lived experience I guess through this like um, paperly <laughs> form that it that they exist in. So just sort of interested in that. I also thought I'd just talk a little bit about process. I don't know if it's interesting to people, but just like how I build a painting. Um, so kind of coming back to like the waiting game painting that I was showing um, a little while back. This is kind of how I started it. Um, so this is kind of an underpainting and all my paintings start this way. I, I usually connect with just a monochromatic drawing with um, usually like burnt sienna or burnt umber some form of brown and i'm just really hashing out the general composition i usually don't think about light a lot at this stage just a little bit in general of like big shadows but in terms of like how high contrast i want things to be that kind of comes in a little bit later um and and as i was saying i kind of watch things across time so as i notice different light scenarios present themselves like it kind of tends to evolve um, and then I kind of go into a color block in, so I'm just sort of mapping in large forms, like what I notice in the, in the sort of high contrast. I usually really limit myself at this stage to like a mid-tone, a shadow tone, and a highlight tone. Um, and then from there I'm kind of, you know, just blocking in more heavily. You can see I've decided to add like a shadow, so that was something that kind of happened as I was working across. And this painting was actually interesting because as I was working on it, I was actually hopping, because I was doing a residency, I was hopping between three spaces. So this um, chair was kind of moving with me as well as like all of the components. Um, but but again, it sort of actually does reference a space that's that's in my childhood home that I kind of referred back to, to construct the floor. Um, and there's sort of the finished painting. So I'm kind of very much layering and deciding like on brightness and, and whatnot as I'm kind of working through and, and, and painting it. And that's kind of the painting in situ as, as I'm kind of working on it. Um, just to get like show a few sort of behind the scenes as well, if that's of interest. This is kind of me working on that looking glass painting with my mom. So I kind of have the whole setup and um, what I normally do with these types of paintings that require like sustained poses, the person won't be there for the whole time. I kind of go in and out. So, you know, if I'm painting, if I was working on the glass work, um, some of the parts I would have her sitting there for when I'm kind of pinning down the reflections. But once it gets to a certain stage, I'd be able to kind of paint certain sections without the model there. So I'd kind of be hopping back and forth. Um, 
also depending kind of on on where I was at I actually have a mannequin that I use in the studio so if it's a sweater and that type of thing sometimes I will use that um, but obviously for things like the hand and the hair and the face it would require the model to be there but I, I try to be flexible kind of as I'm working to accommodate different things and there's sort of my mom again <laughs> sitting for me um, for this piece as well so it kind of go in and out based on, on what I needed uh, there is a mannequin <laughs> with the shirt that I'm painting, so that kind of pops back and forth as well. Um, I actually also have like a time lapse. I don't know if that's of interest, but I'm hoping that it'll transmit okay if I share it with that. I'm just going to set this up here. It kind of shows like a painting throughout the stages, so you get a sense of, oops, kind of what would transpire. So this um, is going to be the painting of um, Outside In that I was showing you the, from the resident CHC me. And just let me know if the video is glitching out or anything weird happens. So this is kind of how I'd start with the underpainting. And then I'm kind of going through and doing my color block in through there. I'm sorry my phone is going. I'm just going to ignore that. <laughs> Um, and then I'm kind of just penciling in the trees, blocking the layers, and I really try to work up different sections of the painting a little bit together because I like to not finish one part and then leave everything else. Um, I'm kind of modifying and making changes to the piece as I go based on sort of what felt right to do and, and my reaction to the subject matter as I was working on it. So destabilizing it further, a lot of that happened. I continued to kind of make additional cutouts to this piece and to kind of unpack it a little bit further. Um, as I kind of build through, through the layers, I'm adding more texture, I'm noticing more things. This piece could be, really became interesting because I was navigating like another artist's style because I'm creating a painting of a painting. And so what ended up happening is I really translated that painting into my style. Um, and I really tried to think about, you know, almost like that, that painting of the boy as like, what would the real boy have been like? And so I was kind of almost telling a certain story in my head as I was unpacking that. Um, yeah, and I think one of the last things I'll share and then we can kind of go to a Q&A is I just have like a little video tour of like my studio and I was um, painting some of these works and just so you can kind of see what I normally have set up because I'm not in my studio today so you can't really see it. Um, this is actually not my current studio but it was for a little while. Um, when I was at Berard Arts. Um, so this is just kind of when I had that, that pot of daisies that you can see from that painting. I also have the shirts kind of laid out that I was working from from different paintings. So those that would usually be kind of put on the mannequins as I'm working through. And this is just gonna kind of show you some close-ups of, of those paintings as I kind of pan across. But these were, when all of these works were kind of in progress and they all kind of filtered into a series a little bit together. So they're in various forms of completion. These are all a little bit less finished than um, where they were at kind of when I showed them before. Um, but yeah, and then the other thing that I also often have are like little studies. I always keep um, a mirror that you can sort of see in the back there in my studio as well because as I'm painting myself, there's the mannequin, <laughs> um, I like to refer to the mirror um, just to kind of cross-reference color. I, I ideally like to have a window handy so that I can see things and assess things in natural light um, and kind of get a sense of that. And then we're just going to pan to kind of where I had that waiting game painting set up here. Um, and I have a floorboard as well because I wasn't in the space I was painting at that time so I wanted to bring a piece of the floor actually with me so that I could sort of see what it looks like. So whenever I'm not painting on site I'll try to bring pieces of the space that I am painting to kind of reconnect to that environment and as a way of accessing it as much as I can. Um, yeah, so that's kind of basically an overview of my work. I guess the theme that sort of runs through all of this for me is like really the relative slowness of painting as a platform for consideration. And I really using the process as a way to like observe, consider, um, decode and recode the encounters that I have with myself and the, the outside world um, and to question I guess what it means to see um, and what it means to be seen and how those two things interrelate as an artist as a viewer as a subject and how that all kind of conglomerates together um, yeah and I guess I'd like to just open it up if there's any discussion or questions or things anyone would like to add Just thank you so much. That was amazing. I was just, every painting, I was just like, what? <laughs>
Yeah, um, it's just so impressive and incredible what you can do. Um, I guess I guess I have some questions. They're not like the most um, interesting, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, the residency at the Burrard Arts Foundation. Um, how long was it? And did you finish like all those paintings you showed in that studio, like during the residency? Because I was like. Uh, it was probably the most intense residency of my life. <laughs> yeah. it, it was a three month residency. Um, I did six paintings in that time. And for me, that's um, a very heightened turnaround time because usually I would spend at least six months on one painting. So I didn't really sleep. <laughs> Um, and the only way it kind of worked was I, I built them all up together. So right from the beginning, I kind of had everything. The compositions were pre-planned. Pre I, I knew, I mean, of course, they evolved a little bit, but I knew what I wanted to go in conceptually doing. And I kind of started them all at the beginning and then just bounced back and forth. And, and I think the only way it was really possible is because it was over the summer. And um, oil paint does dry a little bit faster in the in warmer weather so i was able to kind of get through them a little bit quicker in that way yeah <laughs> oh yeah that's, that's that's amazing uh rick has a question go ahead um, i guess you kind of already answered it just now but um you it, it's uh, you mentioned that you uh have like an idea of the painting kind of like beforehand but did like uh, is it all there or do you like discover things as you go along like um in, there was the one painting that you mentioned where you you were kind of painting it and, and the lighting and the shadows would change over time. Was that something that you wanted to capture from the get-go or was that something that you kind of noticed and then worked it in after the fact? There's always a certain amount of discovery. I mean, I go into a painting, usually the process for me will be, um, I guess I didn't really show very much of this sort of before, what happens before I started painting, because there's a lot of sketching that happens, a lot of just private sketchbook work. And I'm, I'm pretty, that's something that's just like, for me, I, I do a lot of um, doodling and just kind of playing around. And I do get the compositions pretty pinned down just because of the style I work, but um, a lot of things do shift and change. So for instance, particularly in the daisies one, I did not have a composition of the daisies pinned down. I knew kind of the pose I wanted the figure in, but you know, as the painting goes on, that evolves. Uh, light and shadow changes a lot. Um, often I, you know, won't necessarily know how high contrast I want things to be, how intense the feeling of the mood, the color will change a lot. Um, sometimes certain things in the pose also change, but usually I try to get big changes hashed out in the underpainting um, because it's just easier for me to kind of deal with that when it's monochrome. <laughs> I don't really like to, to make big changes if I can avoid it, although it has happened. Um, but usually that gets dealt with earlier and then things like mood and light are the main things that change. And then subtle things, like I might, you know, slice a sliver off or reposition a finger or hair and that kind of thing will shift as the painting goes on. But the changes kind of become smaller and smaller through the layers. That's really cool, thank you. Yeah, I guess um, I'm curious to know where this all started because I can see like you know the two series are connected and like I know in my own work like one idea leads to another or they branch off from each other like they're all quite connected um yeah so where did this all start for you like the, the portraiture yeah that's that's an interesting question I think I think for me I'm trying to yeah I don't know I guess I've, I've always been really drawn to figurative work and kind of the sense of, of just like working from the body. I feel like I just connect with that from, from an identity perspective. Um, I have gone through sort of different ways of doing that. I think like if I go way, way back, my style didn't used to be realism. It used to be probably a lot more like expressive um, and, and impressionistic even. And then that kind of changed. And, and it's something, you know, I might do more expressive work again, too. I, I'm, I'm trying to get away from this idea of like a linear way of working, too. And like an artist can have more than one series, more than one kind of style as well. So I think it's interesting to kind of explore different things. But I think I, I've always been really interested in um, 
the way that we relate to ourselves across time. And so certainly in coming out of my undergrad, I was really interested in like a kind of like mm, the idea of repeating identity across image and how that kind of just starts. And so I would actually create paintings of other paintings. So I would make a painting of a person that I knew and then I would take that painting and I would put it in like a light context, like where the light was like casting across it or like the light from blinds or or shadows from objects in my environment were getting cast across. And then I create a painting of that painting, but in the new light until it kind of dissolved. And so I was really interested in that idea of like almost like a kind of entropy or just like a sense of distortion and the way the self gets dissolved within time. And so, yeah, that kind of led, I guess, to an interest in materiality and the connection of like painting and materiality and, and the way sense of self shifts based on, on, on meaning shifts across time. And then I kind of came back to, I guess, just like wanting to relate or, or think about identity, I think, through that and, and, and then just thinking about my origins as a painter, which really, like, if I think of my studies kind of came from like, you know, first year art history as the canon of Western art and just kind of how that gets in your head. And, um, and certainly, like, I remember as a young child, like, going to the art gallery and like, being seeing certain paintings and being really drawn to them and then kind of coming back to those same paintings and, as an adult and being like oh yeah that's really beautiful but I really don't connect with the subject matter and then kind of just wanting to unpack that um and respond to it and 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 navigate that in relation to like my own body and I think that's kind of where I landed <laughs> um and sort of where I'm currently currently working it's just sort of yeah but it, for me, just I'm endlessly fascinated by figures and figurative painting and and just everything that the body can say and how we relate to it. I don't know mm -hmm. if that answers your question. <laughs> no, no, that was amazing. Thank you. I guess I'm also interested. Um, so doing your undergrad in Emily Carr, mm -hmm. um, I also did mine there. And I also was a figurative painter when I first started. And I definitely noticed um, sort of pressure to move away from that because it's like very traditional and it's kind of seen as like fusty and not interesting anymore but I, I think like figurative painting has definitely come back in a big way I don't know just if you want, if you want to talk about your experience um kind of um being a figurative painter through school or you know yeah I mean I think Emily Carr obviously is you know it's a conceptual school I have never bought into the division between figurative painting and conceptual painting I think it's perfectly possible for something to be like highly conceptual and figurative. I think it's also possible for something to be um, conceptual and abstract. I don't think that, you know, to say, I mean, it's sort of like, to me, that's the same argument. Like, I don't know how many times different critics have declared like painting in general is dead. People keep mm -hmm. thinking it's not dead. Um, <laughs> I think yeah. as long as you sort of have something to do with it, a way of connecting to it, to me, like, I think anytime, any art really, like when you think about what you're doing and like, this doesn't just go for painting, but I'm going to talk about it in relation to painting because that's what I do. But like, essentially, you're taking this colored mud <laughs> and you're making it represent something. And that by nature is always going to be kind of conceptual because it's it's a, it's an abstract process. Even if I'm making something that it looks like exactly what I'm seeing in front of me, the sense of abstraction, the unpacking that's happening there is like when you think about it, kind of a fantastic and abstract process. Um, but I think for me, the what makes a piece conceptual has nothing to do with how it looks it has to do with like what you're trying to do with it and and as long as like for me I think that there's a lot that more that can be done with figurative painting than has been done even in as I'm working in traditional styles because for me like I kind of want to take back that language that was used in this very specific way and I'm really interested in like what else that language can do um, because I don't feel like my story has been told through that language. And I feel like a lot of other people's stories maybe have not. So it really just depends like what you're trying to do. In terms of my experience at Emily Carr, I think I went through a lot of experimentation when I was there. Like I didn't necessarily start locked in. When I, when I began at Emily Carr, I was actually much more into drawing. I did a lot of like, charcoals and that type of thing. I ended up using figurative painting in very like conceptual ways and I think that's sort of how I kind of went through um well kind of like what I was saying with like 
repeating and then abstracting the figurative form that became kind of a way of conceptually navigating um, the figure as well as what I would do as I made these paintings of like pieces of canvas. Um, so I would actually take like a piece of raw unstretched canvas and I would crumple it up into these forms and then I would photograph it and then I would unwrinkle it and then I would um, stretch it or sometimes not stretch it. I would just leave it on the wall and then I create a painting of like what it had been on the same surface. So I kind of find ways of like navigating um, I guess figurative traditional processes, but in ways that like felt like they were relevant and related to contemporary art. And I feel like that's kind of carried through into my current process where like it might look like stylistically traditional, but if you sort of look at the subject matter and what's happening in the paintings, there's very much a resistance to certain types of historical precedents. So yeah, I guess that's sort of where I came at it. I've never been one to like, just want to conform to I think like the whole point of art, I suppose, is to not to defy the sheet factor. <laughs> so if <laughs> question, Emily Carr was to kind of like, you know, be an abstract artist, I guess for me, the question sort of became like, how can I do this in a way that feels like relevant and interesting? Um, mm -hmm. Where I landed, I guess. But yeah, in terms of like technique and all of that, that was stuff that I had to learn on my own. <laughs> yeah, well, you definitely, done it so <laughs> yeah well done yeah uh yeah well thank you so much that was so so interesting um so yeah. <laughs> all right well is there anything any any other questions for Kara in this last couple minutes <laughs> all right well uh, maybe we should take just a 10 minute break and then we will get into Lynette's artist talk. Sounds perfect. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kara.